Perfect. All right. So, again, welcome to the you know free online study group for the MCAT. This is basically going to be a weekly thing, and what you'll do is you're going to come in and you're going to dial in this number, 213-226-1066. You're going to enter the conference ID 484-471-549 and then press pound. And that way you'll be able to call in and hear the audio much clearer. So make sure to dial in for next time. Now, we have a few members on here right now. So guys, if you just want to type your questions here in the chat box, that will be able to pick it up. And we have somebody who is having a bit of technical difficulties right now who's saying that the number was already there. So Okay, so the structure of this webinar is basically going to be as follows. I'm going to try to go over briefly, uh, you know, the. What second? I got another question. You have to use your cell phone, just like any other call. There we go. So we're going to briefly go over the two things that I think are most important from my experience. I used to tutor for the MCAT, and I also took it a few times. And, and uh, these are the two most important things that I think all successful MCAT students have, and that is that they have a process to study, and they have the motivation to commit. Again, they have, a, they have a process to study and they have a motivation to commit. So those are the two most important things. Now, before I jump into the six parts of the session, I want to briefly talk about who I am and why I'm doing this. And really quickly, my name is Nicholas. I graduated from University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill with degrees in chemistry and philosophy back in 2015. I had taken the MCAT three times, I scored it twice, and it was over the span of two years, from August 2014 to August 2016. And I was struggling with whether or not I even wanted to go to medical school. I felt a lot of pressure from the people around me, and but all of that was, you know, fear. It was all, it was all fear, it was all, you know, I didn't want to disappoint anybody. So I really put a lot of pressure on myself and my relationships the first time I was taking the MCAT and I ended up bombing, it was below 50th percentile, I wasn't happy, and I let that kind of sink in for a while, but I didn't retake the MCAT until after I graduated college. When I graduated college, I came back home, and my father took me out to lunch one day, like literally the next day, and I was telling him how I have doubts about medical school and all this, and he said, really, Nicholas, okay, so if you'd gotten a perfect score on the MCAT, would we be having this conversation about your doubts? And I had no idea how to answer him. So, but he was right. I'm not the type of person to to leave something half done. I'm the type of person who wants to look at himself in the mirror and says, okay, I, I did my best. And one second, there's a question here. I'm logged in to join me. Well, we'll try to the call and do I use the call feature within the join me app or separately via laptop? Use your cell phone to dial in the call. Okay. So, yeah, so then I, so then I studied, and what I was doing is I was working full-time as an analytical chemist because that's what my degree was in, and it was the easiest way to find a job. And so I was trying to work full-time, and this job required overtime, I mean, even on weekends as well. And so I thought that even with all that, I could, I could retake the MCAT and, and score well. But that didn't really work out. 
because again, I was making the same prideful mistake. I was taking on more than I can chew. I was telling myself that I can do this, that I'm great, that everything's fine, while simultaneously adding pressure and pressure and pressure to me because I wanted other people to know that I could handle it when in reality I just couldn't handle it. And so the second time I didn't score it because I knew I didn't do well, so I avoided the exam. But this time, when I finished that exam, I was like, no, I need to change everything now. So I changed everything I could. I locked myself in a room and I just used as much reason as I could to come up with something that's honest and organic and that motivates me to want to study. And that's when I came up with this thing. And I coined it the boogeyman method and it's nothing spectacular, but what it is is it's it's a way for me to remember that the MCAT for me for two years, for almost two years, and even longer, was like the boogeyman. It was terrifying to me. It was something that I I didn't know what it was. I couldn't crack it. I felt like people were like more like like you know uh, brave than me. They had somehow figured something out that I hadn't, but that didn't really coincide with who I thought I was. And so I coined the boogeyman method because I figured, okay, the boogeyman isn't really real. It's just all in my head. The the fear that I get from it. So. What happened with the boogeyman? Why am I no longer afraid? Well, it was because of one day my, my father and my mother comes, came into my room and they flick the light on. They shine a light and they basically say, hey, Nicholas, don't worry. That's not a monster in the corner. It's a teddy bear casting a shadow or it's a tree branch tapping on your window. So it's nothing to be afraid of. So basically it went, the boogeyman is only scary until you know what it is. Just like the MCAT is only scary until you know what it is. And so I started to really break that down and I kind of found myself naturally gravitating towards this method of studying, which I would love to share with you guys right now, which is essentially you practice from day one, you break down what you practice and you pick apart everything you didn't understand, you put everything you didn't understand into a spreadsheet and compile that into flashcards, and then you drill those flashcards until you understand everything at least one time. And then you go back to practicing more passages or even taking a full-length test. And you go round and round and round and round and round. Now, at first, it took me over a week to get through this once. And then it took me you know, upwards of you know, two, three days to keep going through this and churning this method out. And that's how I was able to, in 10 weeks or about 500 hours of studying, I was able to improve my score from the 47th percentile to the 93rd percentile with a huge jump in cars from 52nd percentile to 98th, which was by far my worst subject going into it. Now it's my best, which is crazy. So that's essentially the, the method. Now let me go ahead and quickly answer this guy's question. He says, I'm logged into this via my phone. There's an option in the app to make a call. Do I leave the app and use my phone? Um, I would make a call from there. All right. But don't worry, you will all get the recording. <laughs> okay. So let's check the participant list real quick. All right, great. So now that that's done, I want to quickly ask you guys, anybody have any suggestions for a passage that you'd like to go over? I got a lot of requests for cars because I did pretty well on it. But any suggestions for a passage that you guys would like to crack open right now? I'm pulling all my passages from the AAMC study or section bank. So just let me know. I pretty much have access to all of it that I saved in the document. Oh, I heard a noise. <laughs> I think that possibly there's somebody who has their mic working, just uh, not talking, which is okay. 
Yeah, any passage suggestions? Anybody? Hello? Hey. Who's Hi, this? Um, Hi, this is Michael. Hey, Michael. There you go. How are you? Oh, and any um, any car passes? I'm just I'm just beginning uh, right now. Uh, the starting for them for January. Okay. Yes. So any anything would be uh, just general. You know, any any study tips or anything. Uh, what books to use? You know, um, that would be great. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So what we'll do is we'll we'll reserve about you know, uh, about 45 minutes or so at the end for Q&A, and we'll go over all those questions, resources to use, study tips, all that stuff. But what I wanted to do is jump into a passage right now, because I feel like that's the most efficient way to get the maximum value, is to, is to dive right into the passages and see what it looks like to kind of break them down. Did you have any, any passage that you've thought about uh, that, you've, that you wanted to tackle today, or...? Uh no no I haven't um I'm just starting my um uh, my studies you know for the MCAT uh, just now of course so, yeah of so course okay so then no worries then let me just pick a passage and then you can watch me kind of go through it and break it down that way you'll have already you'll be that much more ahead when it comes to actually strategy how to actually answer the questions how the MCAT asks questions so definitely take some notes because this is going to prepare you to dive into your studying which you're doing from now until January, which is a great amount of time. And then at the end, I'll go over your questions again. Does that sound fair? Yes, thank you. Okay, perfect. All right then, guys, I'm just going to go ahead and dive into cars because I got a lot of uh, private messages, um, like emails and you know Reddit messages as well, and uh, asking me about cars and that approach. So uh, we'll just do that because I'm not getting any suggestions. But... Definitely, guys, make sure that when you join, you can participate. It's just like a class. You can speak out. You can ask questions. You can tell me to uh, slow down, speed up, okay? So let's dive into a cars then. Okay. So you guys should all be able to see this passage. Now let me... First, try and see if, yes, okay, so it's good. Um, so the approach that I use for cars is I read the entire passage at one time, and I do a few things when I'm reading the passage. The way I read the passage is actually very theatrical very theatrical performance. I imagine myself as an actor and that the Cars passage is my script. And when I read that, I read it with emotion. I'm supposed to be playing the role of the author of the passage. The reason why I do this and why I came up with this was because I got so freaking bored of taking so many passages over and over and over again, I was falling asleep. And a huge part about my weaknesses is that I can't focus. I zone out quite easily and my mind wanders, especially when I'm just in my bedroom studying by myself. So this way, what happens is that not, it's, it's a byproduct of reading this theatrically, pretending that you are the author and this is your script. But what that does more importantly is just like actors try to get inside the minds of the character and bring that to life, by reading this theatrically, which is literally as easy as just slowing down, you know, maybe even using some hand motions, being more emotive, being more emphatic, being less monotonous when you read, it makes it stick in your brain a bit more. Because the re one of the reasons why is because I remember reading that when you read something from an outside perspective, you don't care as much as if you were to read it as if it was your own story. So if it was something about you, it would be very interesting to you. You'd want to read it more. It would stick more because it's like, oh, this is about me. So this is one. these are the kind of tips that I use for approaching Cars passages is that I read it theatrically. I read it with emotion. But the biggest reason why I do this is because when you read with emotion, 
you begin to see patterns in the arguments of every passage. And when, you're, when I'm reading the passage, I'm looking for two things. I'm looking for, one, the shift in tone, and two, the main idea. So when I say shift in tone, let me give you an example. Imagine that I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll say a, a couple of sentences, and then I want you to predict what's the next word I'm going to say. Okay, here we go. Yeah, cookies are great. You know, they, they taste good. They have a lot of different flavors, and they can be pretty easy to make and a fun experience for kids. What's the next word I'm going to say? If anybody wants to chime in. Three, two, one. The next word is but. They're unhealthy and they're this and they're that and they're this. So that's what I call a shift in tone. It's, it's when basically it's when basically you are posing somebody else's arguments only to shoot it down. It's like you're giving yourself an alley-oop. That's how people argue. That's how most of these people who write the passages, that's how they argue. They give somebody some argument, and then they shoot it down. So that's what I look for, is like the, is like the, the different shifts in tones that, that authors like to express. Because the reason why I, I, I was confident in this is because when when you realize it, all of these passages come from experts. These people are experts in their fields. And what do all experts have in common about the work that they write about? Passion. They care about what they're talking about. They want you to understand what they're saying. They're not trying to trick you. They're actually trying to express the argument in the way that they can. So when you realize that, it really makes sense to kind of read it theatrically and with emotion because you're pretty much matching the level of language that they are. So yeah, you understand the shift in tone, and because you understand the shift in tone, number two is the main idea, you'll be able to extract the main idea, which is basically what's the point of the argument. So for, the, for me, the argument was, like the, the main idea is that cookies are unhealthy. Cookies are unhealthy and, you know, blah, blah, blah. They should be banned from whatever. I don't know. So that's the main idea. And the only reason why I got the main idea was because I looked for the shift in tone where I went from saying that cookies are, are, yeah, you know, they're fun and they taste good, whatever, but they're unhealthy, blah, 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 blah. So as you read these passages for cars, you'll be able to pick it up more easily. So let me try and I'll actually pick a different cars passage. Let's just see. Well, actually, this one's good. So, okay, let's dive right in. So what I do again is I, I read the I read the the passage uh, fully all the way through, and then I move on to the questions. Now I almost never have to go back up to the passage when I answer the questions unless I need to. So I'm not super rigid. There's nothing rigid or strict to follow here, guys. It's it's purely a guideline. So this passage comes from the AAMC section bank. Or sorry, 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 the uh, question pack, question pack, AAMC question pack, and it's passage 15. Yep, okay, good. So <clears throat> essentially, essentially what I was going to say is that, yeah, so I read the whole passage at one time, and then I approach the questions. Now I can go back up to the questions if I feel like I need to, or if I don't have to, I won't. But generally speaking, when I was training for this, I tried to basically fit the reading and the answering of the passage to 10 minutes because there's nine passages, about 90 minutes section, so 10 minutes per passage was my goal. That's what I kept, kept in mind. So I would read slowly at first, actually, when I was training. I, I read it untimed because I don't like doing timed at first, especially not while training because there's no reason why I have to be perfect time from the start. That's the purpose of training is to get faster and faster and faster. So I didn't do it timed. I actually made sure to follow the strategy 100% and 
and then my speed came as I practiced. It was just a byproduct of practicing a lot. So I never actually worked, focused on time until like the last half of my studying. Once I felt comfortable with the strategy and my habits were ingrained very strongly. So, okay, so let's read the, fir- the full passage. Um, I would inevitably like to read it all in our heads, but I suppose for this, because we don't have too many people on the webinar, I'll just go ahead and read it the way I would normally read it. Um, so bear in mind that when you're taking the MCAT, you can't read out loud, but you can still mouth things and you can still move your hands a little bit. So I do do that. And I actually follow the, the, the screen with my finger. I point on the screen and I read like that whenever I take the test. Okay, so let's read the title first. It says about looking, which I have no idea what that means, so that doesn't really help me. And so I'll scroll back up here. And what I like to do is I like to close my eyes for like two seconds, take a deep breath. Okay. The relationship of the professional artist to the class that ruled or aspired to rule was complicated, various, and should not be simplified. The artist's training, however, there's a shift in tone, and it was training which made the artist a professional, taught the artist a set of conventional skills. That is to say, the artist became skilled in using a set of conventions of composition, drawing, blah, 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 blah. And these conventions corresponded so closely to the social experience, or anyway, to the social manners, of the class the artist was serving that they were not even seen as conventions but were thought of as the only way of recording and preserving eternal truths. Okay, so that's basically saying that you have the artist and you have the class that rules over them, the people that they serve. And the conventions that they trained in taught them a lot of these awesome skills, perspective, anatomy, all these different things. And those conventions, those skills, when they apply them into art, corresponded so closely to only the ruling class, right, to the class that it was serving, that it wasn't even seen as conventions, but we're just like, yeah, that's that's the only way we do things. That's what truths are. That's what life looks like to us. Yet, so here's another big shift in tone, to the other social classes, such professional painting appeared to be so remote from their own experience that they saw it as mere social convention a mere blah, blah, blah of the class that ruled over them, which is why in moments of revolt, painting and sculpture were often destroyed. Interesting. Okay, so definitely we understand what this guy is trying to say, right? They're trying to say that it was the art. So the first shift in tone was here. So that we know that means basically this is important. So the training was what made the artist professional and the training taught the artist these fancy skills, and those fancy skills only allowed the artist to record the ruling class's lifestyle, and yet to the other social classes, those skills did not allow them, did not allow artists to record truths from the other social classes' experience. So that's basically the point. So the, the set of conventions that the artists learned and were taught seem to only reflect the ruling class and the other classes were kind of, you know, butthurt, if I can be so crude. <laughs> but basically, yeah, that's what it was. So let's let's keep reading. I think it's uh, fairly straightforward here. During the 19th century, certain artists, for consciously social or political reasons, tried to extend the professional tradition of painting so that it might express the experience of other classes. Okay, so so other so artists kind of knew this and they tried to extend it. They really tried. But it let's see what happens. Uh their personal struggles, their failures and the opposition they met with were a measure of the ambition of the undertaking. So it was not really welcomed. Like those artists were not really welcomed to to try and extend painting to the working classes. 
Perhaps one pedestrian example will give some idea of the extent of the difficulties involved. Consider this guy's well-known painting of work. It shows a team of laborers with passers-by and bystanders, you know, working on a sidewalk. It took the painter 10 years to complete. Oh, my God. And it is at one level extremely accurate. But there we go, another shift in tone. It looks like a religious scene. <laughs> so he failed. He failed to capture what it's supposed to look like. Some would argue that this is because the artist's attitude. Oh, here we go. Some would argue that this is because of the artist's attitude to his subject was ambivalent. I would argue, here we go, that's another shift in tone. Fantastic. So the author, him or herself, is actually explicitly telling us what they would argue. That all the visual means he was using with such care preempted the possibility of depicting manual work as the subject, as the main subject of painting in any but a mythological or symbolic way. So essentially, again, the same argument that this first paragraph was telling us, that because of the very means with which they would paint, the conventions that they use, it's, it's preventing, it's not even possible to use those conventions and reflect the social classes apart from the ruling class. That's what this is trying to say. This guy spent 10 years, he really tried his best, but that in and of itself was, the, was setting himself up for failure. So yeah, there you go. So it's pretty much supporting the first paragraph. I don't have to write anything down because it's one argument so far and I'm not confused in my head. If you're confused, by all means write stuff down and take notes. I don't need to because so far it's the same argument that the artists were taught some fancy stuff that fancy stuff only allows them to depict fancy lifestyle. Third paragraph, the crisis provoked by those who try to extend the area of experience to which painting might be open continued into the 20th century. Okay, so from the 19th century they tried and they continued into the 20th century. But, so a shift in tone, its terms were reversed. Okay, so the tradition was indeed dismantled. Okay, wow, so the tradition was dismantled. But, so another shift in tone, except for the introduction of the unconscious, the area of experience from which most European artists drew remained surprisingly unchanged. Interesting. So, yeah, they managed to break through this set of conventions. Art kind of evolved in that way. But... They just didn't really have any other experiences to draw upon. Consequently, most of the serious art of the period dealt either with the experience of various kinds of isolation or with the narrow experience of painting itself. And the latter produced painting about painting, and which is called abstract art. So again, they dismantled the tradition, the set of conventions, right? But they just kind of lost. They don't really have any other way of looking at the world. So they ended up resorting to reflecting their own isolation or the act of them painting, which is a very narrow set of experiences. And that, that's not what they tried to do. They tried to extend the area of experience, right? Same thing over here. They tried to extend the professional tradition. Yeah. So let's keep going. But it's the same, basic, basically it's the same art, uh, argument. And we're almost done with the passage. Great. So it says, one of the reasons the potential freedom gained by the dismantling of the tradition was not used may be the way painters were still trained. Oh, okay. In the academies and art schools, they first learned those very conventions which were being dismantled. Aha, back to those conventions again. This is because no other professional body of knowledge existed to be taught. Got it. Thus, the extreme of abstract art demonstrates, as an epilogue, the original uncertainty of professional art. An art in reality concerned with a selective, very reduced area of experience, which nevertheless claims to be universal. How oh, interesting. So, again, um, don't be fooled by this. This is not the main argument. Okay, just because it's in the concluding sentence of the passage does not mean it's the main argument. Imagine yourself, you were actually writing this passage and you wanted to end it on a very impactful note. That's all this person's doing. It's just like you or me. 
We want to end our passage. We want to end our arguments with something like, oh, look at that. That's a nice jab, or that's very emotional, or that's very impactful. But that doesn't express the entirety of the argument. So don't be fooled by one sentence. Make sure that you look at the passage as a whole. Do not miss the forest for the trees, because otherwise um, you won't have a lot of support to answer questions with, which I'll go into a little bit in a little bit detail in a few minutes. So the main idea of this passage is, again, that there's some conventions that these artists were taught with. Those things were very fancy. Those conventions were fancy. And the fancy techniques failed to, ex to reflect all the social classes. They could only reflect the fancy classes. So that's the main argument, which is great. So let's look at this. Oh, fantastic. So the main argument of the passage is that, so here's how I approach answering questions. Now imagine that there's four answers here, right? A, B, C, D. That's fantastic. But what if I wanted to make answer choice E? And so I do this in my mind. I make answer choice E. And answer choice E, in my opinion, from my knowledge of the passage, from my understanding of the passage, will be the best answer. OK? So answer choice E will be the best answer. So I just told you guys what I think the main argument of the passage is. It's again, artists were taught fancy stuff, and so that only allows them to reflect fancy lifestyle. That's the point, right? So what I do from here is, this is how I approach uh, answering questions. And it's something that I was misguided at first. Like I was taught process of elimination wrong, I was taught to just look at all four answer choices at one time, and then, okay, A looks wrong, C looks wrong, okay, B versus B. Let's see. Uh, I think, yeah, B. Like, that, that's, that's actually not a very good way of approaching process elimination. It, it's not as good as what I'm about to show you. Now, what I'm about to show you is I came up with it because I was thinking about March Madness, which my alma mater... Uh, won last year. They won the college basketball tournament. But I was thinking about, I was like, does that mean that they're the best team in all of college basketball? And not necessarily. It just means that of the teams they played in the tournament bracket, they were better than that specific team at that specific time. So I'm like, that's a great way to eliminate things. And so I came here and I thought, instead of looking at all of the answers at once and kind of eyeballing and saying, okay, that doesn't look good, let's start here, that one's look, what I started to do was I started to pair two answer choices at a time, and I started to see which one of those two answer choices is stronger than the other. For example, if A is stronger than B, then the answer will never be B then I can cross it out. If A is stronger than C, then I can cross out C, because it'll never be C. If A is stronger than D, same thing. And you might be thinking to yourself, what's so innovative about that? Well, again, think about your own habits. When I observed my habits of test taking, I found that by doing process of elimination the way that I was taught originally, Sometimes I ended up crossing off all four. I was like, none of these answers seem good. You know what I mean? And that left me back with square one. So I was like, I got to go methodically answer by answer so that even if it's not the strongest answer that I think, it's the strongest of the four. That's the point. Just like North Carolina, it might not be the strongest basketball team, period, but of the teams it faces, it is stronger than those teams. So start to approach it that way. See what you think. Um, it seems to be helpful. But that's why I include answer choice E, so that my head is, like, I, I, I make sure that in my head I have the, what I think is the strongest answer written down as well, or it doesn't have to be written down. You can have it in your head. And so here's the first step. So the main argument of the passage is that, and we said that it's, you know, fancy conventions, lead to only reflection of fancy lifestyle. So let's, let's look at A. And we'll just, before we cross it off, 
let's compare A to E, and we'll, we'll get A going, see if A is generally strong or generally weak. So A says the main argument is that the relationship between artists and the ruling classes throughout history has been complex and difficult to understand. Um, it's kind of weak. Uh, I have to think really hard and rationalize in order to make it seem strong. But I do understand where they're getting that from. They're getting it from the opening statements, right, the first paragraph. So it's relatively strong. But, I don't, you know, I'm not sure if it's really what we think is the strongest one. So let's look at A versus B. Which one's stronger, A versus B? So B says the main argument of the passage is that artists of the past required strong professional training in order to do work that would appeal to the ruling class. Okay, at least it's talking about the training. But it wasn't really saying that the point was to appeal to the ruling class. The point's actually not to really appeal to the ruling class. The point of art was to be extended to a lot of other areas. So, I mean, between these two things, which one do you guys think is the strongest one? Well, compared to our answer E up here, uh, B is the only one that actually talks about the training. So I would say B beats A. Now I can go ahead and cross off A. Awesome. So now we go B versus C. Which one's stronger? C says the professional training of artists has served to limit the areas of experience from which they draw their subjects. Perfect. That sounds so much closer to what we said. So C is definitely stronger than B, even though they both talk about training. C applies it in a way that's more close to our answer. So we can cross off B now. Let's go C versus D. The main argument of the passage is that artists who attempt to abandon conventional methods must confront a great deal, must confront a great deal of opposition from the ruling class. Ooh, that's not a bad one. That's not a bad one. But remember, which so here's where I'm going to bust out this uh another tip for you guys. Okay, you can write this one down. So the way that I answer questions is I use the acronym, let me write it down right here, M S L R. Okay. And M S L R means most support, least rationalization. Okay, most support, least rationalization. So you might be thinking, okay, well, how do I know what's the most support? Literally, whichever has the most support in the passage. If it's talked about more in the passage, it has more support. Well, then how do I know what's least rationalization? This is what rationalization looks like. You're looking at the answer choice, and like for answer choice D, we're reading it, and then we're like, artists who attempt to abandon conventional methods must confront a great deal of opposition from the ruling class. Then we look up, right? We like, we like our heads like tilt up and to the left because we're thinking about ways to make that true. Like, oh, I guess, yeah, I guess I could see that this is, this works there. Yeah, you know what? Maybe it is this. Maybe, maybe everything I thought about the passage is wrong and this, this, this answer choice is right. That's rationalization. So don't do it. So if, if, if we look towards C versus D, think about how easily we selected C as a strong answer. We were like, oh, yeah, definitely, this is exactly what we're saying. And then D comes in, you know, D comes in, and um, we're like, ooh, D sounds good, right? But it's not as strong as C because D, we have to spend more time rationalizing the validity of the answer choice. So because C was very simply the, the way that we understood the passage, the answer is, in fact, C. So the more the more you the more you kind of understand this method of approaching questions, the faster you'll be able to churn out. Because what happened to me after ten weeks of you know studying this method and all that stuff, I essentially was able to go through a passage in about five and a half minutes max, and then what would happen is it would take me like maybe like a couple minutes to answer all the questions, which is crazy because of how fast it kind of flowed that way. 
So, okay, so I, Dave asked a question that what's tripping him up is just what I went over trying to rule out one's own biases. Okay, so again, let's, let's take a concrete example of C versus D in this case. So our argument, the way we understood it, is written in answer choice E. And that, on our way of understanding the passage, is that fancy stuff that artists were taught only reflects fancy lifestyle. Okay? That's the main argument of the passage that we thought from our understanding. Okay? That's the assumption we're making, is that fancy stuff that artists were taught only reflects the fancy lifestyle. When we read answer choice C, it says the professional training of artists has served to limit the areas of experience from which they draw their subjects. And we all we we immediately we immediately were like, oh yeah, that sounds pretty much exactly like what I say. And then when we come down to answer choice D, we're reading artists who attempt to abandon conventional methods must confront a great deal of opposition from the ruling class. This, this is not the same, we, we don't have the same, oh my gosh, yes, that's exactly what I wrote. That's what I'm trying to say, Dave, is that you have to be self-aware about being tripped up by answers that sound good because they do have quite a bit of support. Like answer choice D has quite a bit of support in the passage, but it's not the main idea that you extracted when you first understood the passage. So my point is that don't let one answer completely change the way you interpret the entire passage. Because that's, that just screams to me that you didn't take your time with the passage and you didn't understand the shifts in tone, you didn't understand the main idea, and that you don't trust yourself. So when it comes to C, you were like, oh yeah, definitely C sounds like what I think the main argument of the passage is. But then D, it doesn't sound like it. It doesn't. And so what's going to happen is you're going to start rationalizing why D could be the right answer. And the very act of doing that will tell me almost 9 times out of 10 that it's going to be the wrong selection. And this is an area where so many people, myself included, would trip themselves up. They select an answer that seems simple. Yeah, let me see. But isn't there some sort of subjectivity in reading? I can read a passage and come to different conclusions that someone else reads the very same passage. I understand, but that again is not good practice when you're studying and training for the exam. So if you were to read through the entire passage, write down what you think the main idea is, you went through the passage, and I hope you were able to see how I went through it, and basically I circled through every shift in tone, and after every passage, I would basically go over what the main idea was. And after the first paragraph, the main idea was that the training limits the experience. After the second passage, they give an example of how difficult it was. But then again, at the end, the reason why it's difficult is because the training, uh, is because the training um, limits the way they can uh, reflect experience. So although answer choice D says that, yeah, they must, they must abandon conventional methods, or so they, they must confront a great deal of opposition, that's not the main idea because, again, it doesn't have the most support. And if you even think about an argument in general, Dave, if you think about the structure of argument, the structure of arguments is to take an observation, which is basically what D is, and ask the question, why? Why is it that they confronted a great deal? Why is it that, you know, Ford, Maddox, Brown uh, failed to reflect the social classes that he was trying to? Why is it that artists in the 20th century um, even started dismantling the tradition yet still failed to extend the social experience? The first four paragraphs, which is essentially the entire, which is essentially the entire passage, Every single time the author is telling us because the training, because the conventions are limiting the way they can reflect social experience. So I would say, yes, there's some subjectivity, Dave, but I don't think that there's some subjectivity in boiling down the shifts in tone because it's, it's 
that it's the way we use language it, it can be boiled down to um, these certain uh, frameworks you will start to see patterns in arguments the more you practice and I'm telling you that the more that you, you, you think about finding the shift in tone the more you'll be keen in understanding what somebody's actually trying to argue what is the side that the author is actually trying to take and once you go through the passage, you'll realize that answer choice C has the most support and you're using the least rationalization to think about it. So I wouldn't confuse yourself with the subjectivity of, of interpretation because that's actually what we want to avoid. That doesn't help us solve anything to focus on the subjectivity. What helps us solve things is focusing on a framework and a pattern with which authors, even you and me, like we're all, we all argue things in certain ways. But there are certain ways that we argue. It's, it's, it's certain rhetoric that we use. We use things like but or however or I think or I would argue and all these different words and phrases you will start to pick up when you read the car's passages. And it will start to very, very vividly paint the picture of what the heck this author's trying to tell you. Does that make sense? Hope so. So let's keep going. And we'll try and just continue in applying these methods. Uh, number two says, in the context of the passage, of the passage, so it's going to be in the passage somewhere, the term tradition refers primarily to, again, I don't need to go back up to the passage because I remember uh, the way they use tradition happens to be uh, talking about how the set of conventions were indeed dismantled, right? The tradition was indeed dismantled. And the tradition meaning that the set of conventions that they used to paint, which is described in the first two main paragraphs. All these different things, composition, drawing, perspective. These are the, these are the set of conventions. This is the tradition that was dismantled. And so that's what we're going to say is answer choice E is we're going to say that tradition, the answer refers to a set of conventions that they used. Okay, let's look at A, and we'll see whether or not it's strong compared to E. A says tradition refers to the best way to record and preserve eternal artistic truths. Um, I wouldn't say the best way. That's where I'm kind of thinking that's kind of a weak answer, because it, that's not, I mean, compared to our understanding of, of the question. So I would say it's weak, but before we cross it off, let's compare it to B. B says tradition refers primarily to the set of artistic conventions, bingo, that correspond to the social manners of a ruling elite. Absolutely. That sounds almost exactly like our understanding of the passage and the question. So I would say that B is stronger than A, so now I can cross off A. Let's look B versus C. Tradition refers primarily to the system of applying mythological, what the heck, or symbolic, okay, that was like barely mentioned in the passage. So again, I'm using most support, least rationalization to pick out the right answers here. So again, C is, it, this is the beauty of it, about comparing it to B. So compared to B, which one's stronger, B or C? B is stronger, so bye bye C. And the way that B is stronger is because it has the most support and it has the least rationalization. Let's look at B versus D. D says tradition refers primarily to the expansion of the area of artistic experience to include the unconscious. Again, come on. Come on. <laughs> That's like a, a very, very small anecdote that does not have very much support and it requires a lot of rationalization to become the strongest answer between B and D. So B definitely beats D, and so B is the right answer in that case. Next question. The passage implies that art is at its best when it, well, that, what is, let, let's take the implications of the art author. So whenever you have the passage implies in, in your question, this is where you're going to have to put on your thinking cap, and you're going to have to take the main argument, which is that fancy, uh, training, uh, uh, fancy uh, art conventions only reflect fancy people's lifestyles. 
And you have to ask yourself, okay, so what? What's the point of arguing that? What is the implication? That's what this question is trying to ask you. So what does it mean? What is the author trying to say by, by arguing that, you know, um, the set of conventions that the artists train in serve to limit the experience that wish they can draw upon? Well, they're trying to say that art is at its best when it somehow finds a way to break through those, those conventions, when it finds a way to actually be universal, when it finds a way to actually reflect the other social classes other than the ruling class. So that's our answer. Our answer is going to be, yeah, it's when they break through that, that, that limited experience, when they break through those set of conventions. So that's our answer. So we'll look at A and we'll see if that's strong or weak. And A says transcends conventions, which is very strong, so we'll leave A. Let's look at A versus B. Records eternal truths. Again, this is not as supported as A, and it requires more rationalization than A. So A is stronger than B. Let's look at A versus C. Reflects social manners. Interesting. Okay, so this is where I kind of use something that I call the umbrella. So in, in arguments, when, 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 P, when, when AMC gives you answer choices like this, that pretty much touch on the same, same, uh, same points, for example, art is at its best when it transcends conventions. And because it transcends conventions, it will reflect other social manners. So that's the umbrella. So when you're looking between two answer choices that sound pretty supported and sound pretty good, you have to think about, well, like what comes first? It's like, it's like, it's like the square and the rectangle, right? Like, um, a square is a rectangle, but a rectangle is not necessarily a square, right? It's the same thing. Art can reflect social manners, but not necessarily transcend conventions. But if, it's, but if it transcends conventions, it will definitely reflect social manners. So in that case, that's what I'm using to determine the, the stronger implication between A and C. So A beats C in that regard. I hope that makes sense. So think about the square and the rectangle. Okay, so then A versus D. Art is at its best when it treats religious themes. Nope, definitely not stronger than A. So A is the right answer there. Fantastic. I think we got like one or two more questions. Uh, yeah, two more questions here, guys. Almost done. According to the passage, why did past artistic conventions most likely correspond so closely to the social manners of the ruling class? Well, the way I would answer this question, let's see. So according to the passage, so that means that we have to go to the passage to get the answer. Like, like the, the, the answer to the question is somewhere in the passage. It's not a question like this, which is asking implications. This is actually something that's supported in the passage. Very, very important, guys, to understand the semantics of the questions here. Very, very important. So this one says passage implications. This one says according to the passage. So somewhere in the passage, it tells us why the past artistic conventions most likely corresponded so closely to the social manners of the ruling class. Now, if you remember, the way that they, the, where they said that was in the first paragraph. So the artist's training, however, and was training which made the artist professional, taught the artist a set of conventional skills. And these conventions corresponded so closely to the social experience or, so, or anyway to the social manners of the class the artist was serving. There we go. That's the answer right there. So that's most likely why those set of conventions corresponded so closely. Because the things that they were taught were used to uh, reflect the art of some people that they were working for. That's most likely why the set of conventions only reflected the ruling class, because the ruling class ruled over them. They were the ones that were uh, basically, um, they, the artists were serving them. So that's our answer, is that because the artists were working for them, then most likely that's why the conventions they were taught reflected those ruling class. So let's look at A versus E and see if A is strong or weak. Artists were interested in the narrowness and isolation of the ruling classes 
as a historical phenomenon. Nothing in here is supported in the passage from what we just read. So I know it's already weak, but before I cross it off, let's compare it to B just to be sure. Artists felt that the experiences of the ruling class were the only kinds of activity worth recording. Uh, no, I wouldn't say worth recording, but I think it's stronger than A because it has it does talk about um, you know uh, the general experiences of the ruling class, whereas this gives us some random stuff about narrowness and isolation and historical phenomenon. So B is stronger than A, so let's cross off A. Let's look at B versus C. Artists aspired to the wealth and power of the ruling class. Again, that requires us a lot of rationalization. There's no support that says that. I mean, there's no support that says this either, but between B and C, I mean, I mean, it's honestly like pick and choose because they're both pretty weak, right? But let's look at it. So artists felt that the experience of the ruling class were the only kinds of activity worth recording. No, that's, that's definitely not true because the rest of the passage was talking about how 19th and 20th century artists were trying to extend. So let's cross off B because C is more plausible than B. So let's look at C versus D. Artists looked to the members of the ruling class for financial support. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's what happened. They were serving them. So there you go. That's exactly what we're saying basically as well. So this, require, this has the most support and it has the least rationalization again. So D beats C, so D is the correct answer. Yeah, even though it sounds like such a simple and stupid answer, this is the trap that I used to fall into where I would try and predict what the AAMC would, like, like what the type of answer like sounded smart. Like, you know what I mean? Like I would try and pick the answer that I thought, oh, you know what? They're trying to trick me here. It cannot be that simple. It's actually this more complicated. And like, like Dave, you were saying, right? Like what's going to happen is that you're going to start to say, well, you know what? Passages are pretty subjective. Maybe my entire understanding of the passage is wrong. And this one answer choice is going to change my entire understanding of the passage. And I have no reason for changing my beliefs or my opinions of the passage. But I'm going to pick it because I think that it's too easy otherwise. That's what I used to tra fall into, that same trap. But look at this answer choice. Artists looked to the members of the ruling class for financial support. Yeah, that's absolutely what they did. And for example, if there was answer choice E, and answer choice E was more specific to the passage, then answer choice E would be the best answer choice. But unfortunately, or fortunately, there are only four answer choices, and we've systematically gone and we've said, you know, um, B beats A, uh, C beats B, and D beats C. So D is the right answer because C, B, and A will never be stronger than another answer. So we know D is the strongest answer, so we can, we can move on from there. Last question. The discussion of Ford Maddox Brown's painting work shows primarily that, again, it was difficult. Like the guy had a hard time. It took him 10 years and he still failed. So that's basically it. So our answer right here, answer is E in our heads, is that, yeah, the, the reason why, like, so what does it show, right? It shows primarily that, again, it was difficult. He, the dude had a hard time, it took him 10 years, and it, was, uh, and it was a failure. It didn't actually reflect the working class like the painter wanted it to because, again, of the set of conventions that he was trained in. So let's look at A to see if A is strong or weak. Let's see, A says the process of expanding the subject matter of professional art is complex and extremely difficult to achieve. Yeah, yeah, that's strong. Okay, let's look at B. Art that deals with realistic subjects is more powerful than abstract art? No, that's not stronger than A. Because again, it requires more rationalization and it has the least support. Uh, let's look at A versus C. The problems inherent in expanding the subject matter of art are still with us today. Um, Unfortunately, that example was in the 19th century, so it doesn't have more support than A does, actually. C is not, not as strong because it's actually false. It's not even about today. It's about the 19th century. So let's look at A versus D. The relationship between the professional artists and the ruling classes is complicated and should not be simplified. Fantastic. That is something that is stated in the passage in the first paragraph, 
but it has nothing to do with the discussion of this painting. So A is still the strongest answer. So A is the right answer, and we can move on. So congratulations, guys. We just demolished this passage, and all the questions we got were right. So hooray, great. Um, so let's go ahead and and pause there. Let me kind of bring this back up. So So with cars, it's a little different. With cars, what I like to do is I still like to analyze it. I still like to go over. And what I go over when I analyze this passage, let's say I get a few questions wrong, is I have a set of I have a set of conventions, I have a set of strategies that I use. And again, you can write them down. Number one is, is I can even type them in here, the speaker notes right here. Number one is, did I read with emotion? Right? And what I mean by that is, again, did I pretend that the Cars passage was my script, that I'm an actor, and my role is the uh, to pretend to be the author him or herself and read with passion because all experts have passion all experts are trying to get across some opinion some argument they love talking about what they talk about even if it's even if it's incredibly boring for the rest of us they love it so i need to match their level of passion so that i don't miss their understanding of what they're saying so did i read with emotion yes or no if no then I make a, you know, make a mental note or I'll say, you know, yes or no right here. Awesome. If I did, great. Then there's another way that I can, then I just, you know, keep continue to do that. Great job. Um, then I move on to number two, which is basically, uh, did I uh, circle or highlight the shifts in tone? So I'll go back through the passage and I'll be like, oh, shoot, I missed a shift in tone, right? However, yet, but, I would argue, yet, but, all these different things I like to highlight. And if I missed one, that could have been the difference between me understanding the passage and me missing completely the argument. So if I did, congratulations, awesome. Let's check number, number three. Number three is when answering the question, um, did I pay attention to the question, oops, one second, question, whoa. Did I pay attention to the question stem? What I mean by that is, again, remember when we were going through these questions and the question says the main argument of the passage, right? That's a very straightforward question. Um, in the context of the passage, so whenever we see in the context of the passage, whenever we see um, according to the passage, these question stems scream to me, hey, Nicholas, the answer to this question is in the passage specifically. So that's what I mean when I say, did I pay attention to the question stem? Because again, if this says, like number qu uh, question 88 says the passage implies there we go. It's a different question stem. Now I know that the that the uh, the the answer not necessarily will be directly stated in the passage. It's going to be I have to take the main idea and I have to ask the question. So what? And extrapolate it, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So did I pay attention to the question stems? Very important. If I did, which we did, awesome. Let's try number four. Uh, did I? Did I use bracketing to answer, oh sorry, to eliminate answer choices? Yes or no? Now here's where people will get tripped up. Why? Because when I, when I say bracketing, you guys, you guys know by this point that, uh, you know, A versus B, B versus C, C versus D, right? So, when you go back over this passage, when you do it by yourself and you go back over it, you might find that you didn't do it. Why? Because, for example, let's look at question 88 again. 
we had a hard time. We had a hard time. Uh, let me highlight here. We had a hard time picking between C and A. And so, essentially, the reason why I was able to explain why A is a stronger answer is because I broke down what arguments sound like. And to me, I used the whole, you know, uh, square versus rectangle, right? I said a square is a rectangle, but a rectangle is not necessarily a square. Same thing. So when I'm comparing two really difficult answer choices, I go to this strategy. And it helps me out because I'm like, okay, art is at its best when it transcends convention. So, so when art transcends conventions, it also reflects social manners. But when art reflects social manners, that doesn't necessarily mean that it transcends conventions. Right? So that's how I'm able to kind of um, bust through that plateau of getting stuck here when I'm bracketing. Because like when it's between A and C, and I can't pick, I cannot pick which one's stronger, then I, need, then I know that that's an area for growth. Because what would happen that when you're taking the test is that you go to A, you easily cross off A versus B, you easily cross off B. A versus C, you're like, oh my gosh, I have no idea. Let's leave both. So now we have A and C versus D, which doesn't get us anywhere because you still have to pick one answer. So, so when I ask myself the question, did I use bracketing to eliminate answers? If I ever say no, it's because I don't know how to, I don't know the strategy for how to pick a more reasonable answer. And I must come up with a way. I have, to, I have to read about logic. I have to read about reason and arguments and structures like that to understand what, excuse me, what makes sense in this given context. So let's say we did it, and we did it very well. So let's move on to the next one, which is when determining the strongest answer of the bracket, did I use MSLR? And again, that means most support least rationalization. If I find, and you will do this, if you go back over it, and for example, you pick, a, you pick an answer that you had to rationalize, you'll just kind of smile to yourself and like, oh my God, that was so stupid. Like, yeah, duh, this other answer is much more stronger. Darn it, I had that answer picked at first and then I changed my mind. Why do I do that? That's insane, come on you'll start to understand. And then the more you go and you analyze these few questions right here, if you just start with these, you will be phenomenally improving your CAR score every single day. So did I do this, right? And so you analyze these questions here. And, you know, I'm not too strict about organizing CARs. Um, this boogeyman method this this uh, thing is more for it's more for the sciences. It's more for the science sections than it was for cars. I think honestly, guys, like if you just have these five questions and you go through the passage, so you basically you practice the passage and then you analyze it. That's good enough. You don't need to organize and you don't need to drill anything. Just keep practicing passages and then analyzing it just to make sure that you're not slipping up on the strategy and that you know exactly where you tripped up when it came to picking the uh, you know, best answer versus the worst answer. So what I normally did was every day when I would study is I would come in to my room and I would warm up with a Cars passage. That's it, because I mean, I, I found Cars to be the most relaxing of the, of, the, of the four sections only because I know, I mean, this is a pretty simple answer, but the only reason why I found cars was easier is because it doesn't require any graphs. It doesn't have any fancy terms or concepts that I have to know very well. I mean, if you don't have a high level vocabulary or if you don't really read a lot, then yeah, definitely keep a list of some of the vocab words that you want to look into. But for example, chiaroscuro, you know, accoturement, right? Like, I don't really necessarily knew what those words meant, and I was able to get the, the meaning of the passage. I don't know who Ford Maddox Brown is, but if you found that if you would have known those, the meanings of those words, um, and like if, you, if, you knew those, if you knew the meaning of those words, 
and that that would have helped you understand the passage better, then bust open google.com, punch in chiaroscuro definition or acuturement definition or, for, or who is Ford Maddox Brown and take 30 seconds and read about it, you know. But again, we managed to get a very, very uh, good approach to this passage without knowing those words. So that's what I mean when I say it's relaxing, that if this was a science passage and I didn't know a word or I didn't know a phrase, that's not good. Because if I, if I had known that word or that phrase or that concept, that would have greatly helped me understand the whole of the passage. So that's where, that's really where the organization and the drilling and the making of the flashcards come in is with the science passages, which we'll do um, probably next week. We'll jump into uh, like a bio or a, uh, a physical science passage or even a psych if you guys want. I mean, it's up to you guys. But, but yeah, that's basically it with cars. So, so yeah, I mean, I would, I would do a passage or a couple passages in the morning to warm up. I would do my best, really, really do my best, and then I would go over these five questions. And mentally, I would just be as honest as I could and say, did I do this? No. Did I do this? Yes. Um, oh, yes, yes, yes. Very good point, Michael. Uh, he's saying make sure that you ask a question, did you come up with an answer choice E? That's a great point. Thank you so much. Um, and he's right, because that is something that we did every single time. And I suppose that I'm, I do it so, so mechanically that I forgot that it's even part of the strategy. So I really apologize for that. But Michael's right. Make sure that you guys can look at that. Yeah, we did it every single time. And I forgot to write that down. That's crazy. Oh, my gosh. Okay. So, yes, make sure you do that. Did you come up with an answer E? And the reason why this is important is because let's say you said no. The reason why it's important is that if you didn't do that, that means that you weren't confident with your reading of the passage. So you know what you have to work on, which is slowing down and really reading the passage to get to get the the the, the you know these first two points, right? Most likely, if you didn't do six, either you just forgot it because you were lazy, or not because you were lazy. That's kind of harsh, because you feel confident. That's more that's more like what it is. Like you feel really confident. Like I don't need to do that. Um, but mentally speaking, like you don't need to write it down, but mentally speaking, at least think about what your answer to the question would be. The reason why is because you have something to start off the bracketing tournament with. You have something that you know is strong to compare to answer choice A. And once you label A as strong or weak as compared to E, now you can go ahead and say, well, is B stronger than A? Is C stronger than A? Is D stronger than A? And you can begin to actually get a very accurate answer. Um, let's see. How did you differentiate between the B and D in the last question? Um, I, A and D? Okay, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, how did I differentiate between A and D? Okay, real quick, let me erase. Thanks for the question, uh, Pyle. Uh, let's see. Uh, here we go. The discussion of Ford Maddox Brown's painting work shows primarily. So when I see the question stem is the discussion shows, right? That's basically the question stem. So the, the discussion shows. So if it said the discussion implies, then my approach would be a bit different, sure, but not necessarily because it's, it's, when it says the discussion shows, that means that somewhere in the passage, like in the, in, in, this, in the part of the passage that shows the discussion of this painting, meaning uh, this, this paragraph right here, that this example is supposed to show something and that something is the same main argument that <coughs> that basically um, where is this shift in tone? Okay, so it shows a team of laborers blah blah, blah to the and is at one level extremely accurate, but it looks like a religious scene. Some would argue that this is because blah blah blah. So they they're basically painting a whole picture in this paragraph about how it took him again 
you know, um, there it is, sorry. This is exactly what I was talking about. So right here is the support. Perhaps one pedestrian example will give some idea of the extent of the difficulties involved. And then they give the example. So that's, that's how I understood what this example was for um, because the author pretty much tells us here's, what the, here's an example of the extent of the difficulties involved and then they give an example. Um, and so if we just go back to the question, the question asks, the discussion of that painting shows, it's going to show an example of the difficulties involved in extending the, uh, extending the, um, the social classes that art reflects. So what I did was I made an answer choice E, which is basically like exactly what I just said, that the discussion of this painting shows primarily that um, it was super difficult and it still failed to reflect the other social classes that it wanted to. So then I went to A and I saw the process of expanding the subject matter of professional art is complex and extremely difficult to achieve. Yeah, absolutely. That's basically what it's showing. It's showing that it's difficult to achieve. Now D is saying the relationship between the professional artist and the ruling classes is complicated and should not be simplified. Like, let me ask you a question. If, if you want to unmute yourself, if you want to dial in, I would like to hear your argument for why D is stronger than A, because that might be more helpful than me talking. Or you can type it in the chat box and you can tell me yourself now that you know what our, like, our, now you know our understanding of why, you know, why we think this example was shown. We think it was shown because, as the author states, um, it's, uh, it's an example of why it's difficult to achieve. And so we come to A and we're like, yeah, A sounds like it's strong. A is stronger than B. A is stronger than C. So A versus D, I want you to tell me why do you think D is stronger than A? What support do you have? And you might find that as you're, as you're coming up with a way to, to tell me, you might be rationalizing instead of using support from the passage. So, can you hear um, me? Oh, there she is. Yep. Okay. So I don't necessarily think that D is more correct than A. I, if I were taking the test right now, I would probably be confused between A and D and choose either one without having a strong reasoning behind either. The reason why I would, I would probably choose D is because, um, like you said, our E option, the the option that we made up is um, it would take a long time to achieve. It would take a long time to achieve the the the, the professional art. So the way D is structured, it could it could also mean that it, D D is also implying that it will take a long time to achieve the art. I'm um, not, necess not necessarily. I, I really, I think that I understand where you're coming from now. So if you look at A pile, you'll see that what's like the, what's the sentence structure here? It says that the process of expanding the subject matter is difficult to achieve. And in D, it says that the relationship between the professional artist and the ruling class is complicated. So they're actually talking about two very different things. Answer choice A is talking about how it's, that, it's talking about the process of expanding the subject matter, meaning that the process of reflecting other social classes is difficult to achieve, whereas this is saying that the relationship between, let's say, you and the ruling class is complicated. They're, very, they're two very different um, sentence structures. The noun over here is the relationship, but over here it's about the process of expanding. So what did they talk about D in the passage? Yes, they did. That was in the first paragraph. They talked about D over here, which was basically the first opening sentence. But as we found from the shift in tone, that first opening sentence is not the main point. After the shift in tone, they said that the artist's training, however, is the is the real culprit. So, but those two things are okay, guys. Let me um. Let me explain a concept in, in rhetoric. There's something called a red herring, okay? And I, 
Give me one second as I slowly write this out. <laughs> okay. I think that's how you spell it. It's two words. A red herring, or maybe it's hyphen, I'm not sure. But a red herring is something that sounds like, or something that sounds like it and looks like it and smells like it, but it really isn't it. And, I, and I, I'm not sure where the origin of this word came from, but maybe somebody can chime in. I think it's like, like they, like red herring is a fish, but people used to serve red herring um, and tell people that it was like another fish. You know what I mean? So it's like they were fooled into thinking that it was the fish they wanted when in reality it was a red herring. And so it's the same thing here, guys. Like the question is asking about the discussion of that painting. Okay, so we must limit ourselves, we must focus ourselves to the, to, to the discussion of the painting. And that discussion of the painting happens in this paragraph. It happens right here. It doesn't happen in the first paragraph. But answer choice D is only talking about the first paragraph. So that's a red herring. But even deeper than that, um, to answer your question again, Pyle, is the reason why A is stronger than D is because according to our answer choice E, our understanding of the, of the reason why they're showing the discussion, it comes directly from that paragraph. And I'll show you exactly, I'll highlight exactly the sentence that led me to, to, to come to that conclusion. Perhaps one pedestrian example will give some idea of the extent of difficulties involved. And what is the extent of the difficulties involved in? Well, they were trying to express the experience of other classes. So that's where I get the support from. And so when I come down here and I look at A versus D, I'm like, which one has the most support? Which one requires the most rationalization? A definitely has the most support. Why? Because it says it's talking about the process of expanding subject matter. That's number one. And it says that it's extremely difficult to achieve. Perfect. It's a perfect fit. Whereas D is not talking about the process of expanding subject matter, but at least it does use the word complicated. But that's a red herring. It's looking like something that you think is right, when in reality it's completely, um, it's a complete distraction. It's not at all the focus of, of the question or the, or the answers. Um, does, that, does that make sense? I hope so. Good. Okay, it does. Now, I want to talk to you guys about something that you might not be aware of, and that's the, the test writers, the writers of the AAMC exam, they're actually human beings. I know that's kind of like weird to think about, but they're actually real people. And real people have, you know, uh, jobs, and they have bosses, and they have people who are telling them how to do their job and what, what, uh, what they should be doing. And so think about what is the job of a test writer? The job of a test writer isn't actually to give MCAT students grief. The job of the test writer is to create a standardized test that pretty much all medical schools use as essentially the basis for whether or not a student is accepted, which is insane, but that's a different rant altogether. Anyways, they rely on these test writers, these human beings with these jobs, these professors or PhDs, whatever, who come up with these questions to make an accurate representation of, of uh, what it means to be a critical thinker, what it means to be a problem solver, so that that kind of a student can be accepted into the medical field and not the type of students who cannot think critically or, or on that level. So, but imagine yourself now that you are really angry with the AMC because you know that you got a couple questions where, like let's say you had the, you were given back your answers for the exam, right? And you're, you're allowed to see which questions you got right and which questions you got wrong, which I think you should be, but um, again, it's not my prerogative. Uh, but imagine that you were allowed that. Now you look at uh, question number 90 and you get the question wrong because you pick answer choice D, right? You selected D as your answer and the answer was A. And you're like, oh my gosh, the, those AMC people, how dare they? 
Well, imagine you had the capacity to sue these people because, you know, uh, whatever, you know, they this, this, this one question or whatever caused your score to be low enough and that's the reason why, you know, um, and that's the reason why you didn't get into medical school or whatever it is, right? In a court of law, answer choice is going to hold up much better than, uh, answer choice A is going to hold up much better than answer choice D. So start to think about it that way. Whenever I say most important least rationalization, imagine that the AMC, they don't want to make answer choices ambiguous, as weird as that sounds. In fact, test prep companies, when you take, you know, Kaplan or Princeton Review or Next Step, these types of practice tests, they're businesses. They don't have organizations relying on them to be standardized. They, there are no regulations in, in the businesses. So they can make answer choices ambiguous. They can make it more difficult or less difficult or whatever. But the AMC actually does a fantastic job of making answer choices when you break it down like I am. Oh, yeah, it makes sense. Answer choice is A. Oops. You know what I mean? Like, so take a deep breath and like, find comfort in that. Find comfort in the fact that the AMC, the actual real deal, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> the real deal um, you know, the real MCAT, the practice material like you guys are going through right now, this is from the question packs. Like all of these questions and answer choices, you pretty much won't find an answer that that doesn't, that isn't correct, that doesn't have the most support least rationalization. Like if the answer choice is correct, it's because of this. Um, now, yeah, so... That's what I wanted to say to you guys is that basically remember that the AMC actually doesn't want to make this super scary. They don't want to make this super ambiguous. They don't want any of these things because they have bosses and they have people relying on them to make sure this stuff is clear. So I hope that gives you guys some sort of um, something to ponder. Okay. Um, yeah, so let's see. Um, Q and A session. Yeah. Uh, any other questions, guys? We have you know, fifteen twenty minutes or so. Um. Oh yeah, Michael, you had. I know you had questions. I'll I'll answer yours first about the resources that I use. Now let me show you real quick. I'm working on a massive blog post, which is basically like I I wrote it down like the the only blog post you ever need, but it's like really really big. <laughs> so, uh, just bear with me. I'm going to try to go through it, and I, I have the list of resources here. One second, one second. Okay, I think it's here. It should be here. Oh, there it is. Cool. So, what resources do I use to practice passages? Um, uh, here's a link of, or here's a list of links to free content review and paid passages and full-length practice exams that I recommend. Um, Michael, you can just uh, shoot me an email and I'll respond and I'll copy and paste this or you can write it down right now. But basically, guys, this might be crazy, but I don't use test prep books. I think that they're a waste of money. That's just my opinion. I think that the classes are a waste of money. I think that $2,000 is um, exploitative and manipulative of those companies to do that. I think that I could go off on a huge rant about how much I vehemently disagree with Kaplan and Princeton Review and all those guys, and this is actually why I'm starting what I'm starting right now with my own thing. Um, but I feel like content, information, knowledge, strategy, I feel like it should be free, in my opinion. Now the organizations and like maybe like, you know, maybe this study group becomes private as we go on, but for right now it's free. Um, uh, but, you know, I think that practice tests, yeah, definitely pay for those guys. Save your money and buy as many questions as you can get your hands on. So what I would recommend is that for content, you use your boy Google. Google is the best thing that I go to. Number one thing that I go to to answer questions is Google.com. Um, and I sift through any page until I understand the concept. Um, then another one I use is AK Lectures. This dude is fantastic at explaining concepts. Um, I believe he's still a med student. I think he's in his residency. I'm not sure. But yeah, aklectures.com, fantastic. Exam Crackers, this is a link. Um, it's actually a, a free resource that some dude put together of all the notes from the Exam Crackers books. So 
there you go. And then Khan Academy, as you guys know, I pretty much watched every Khan Academy video in the MCAT section just because it's just another source of information that if I can glean some sort of understanding of a concept on, then I would do that. And the way that I watch videos, guys, is I, I put the videos on 1.5 or 2 times speed, and I put the captions on. So I have 2x speed, and I have the closed captioning. This way, I can focus and I can be reading it, and I can be listening to it, and I can be watching it, and I'm not wasting time. And if need be, I can literally watch the video twice and get more information than somebody who just watches it on one time speed once with the same amount of time. So that's a bit of a hack that I use that I'm sure it's common, but if you guys don't know about it, definitely watch, start watching your videos on 1.5 or 2 times speed, depending upon your fluency of English and then watch it on closed captioning, and uh, it'd be good to go. Um, but then when it comes to paying for stuff, pay for the question packs. Pay for the section bank. I bought the Next Step 10-pack uh, bundle for, I believe, like 220 bucks, um, and you can take each test five times. So that's essentially up to 50 practice exams, which is crazy. Um, but I definitely did all 10 of those. The sample tests and then the full lengths one and two from the AMC, Guys, start here for sure for, for paying and then start here for, 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 uh, for content review. And then when it comes to like basically being able to get advice of the overall process of studying, you guys have me now. So hopefully that should be a good resource to kind of put them all together. And yeah, so that's what I would say to resources. Hopefully that answers your question. Anything else? Any other questions, guys? If if not, uh, feel free to dip out, and uh, I'll still get you guys this recording. But if so, you know I'll be here for another 10, 15 minutes. You know, so you can keep asking me as many questions as you as you'd like. Do 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 do. Thank you. I'll shoot you a mail. Also, MSLR can be used for other sections. Yep. Yep, yep. Um, MSLR can be used for other sections. So absolutely, dude. It's insane. Like I'm telling you, once you kind of get into the habit of looking at the way you answer questions, I'm telling you, like the students that I used to tutor, like there was this one girl who got a 515, which like I almost cried about. <laughs> I was like, oh, my God. Like, I asked her immediately for feedback. I was like, I was like, please tell me what, what was it that, that really helped you? And two things, the two things that helped her were, was MSLR, was this way of like bracketing the answer choices. Like that saved her so much time, so much heartache. She didn't second guess herself. It's insane how much she got from that. And number two, was the process of studying that when you analyze a passage, like for the sciences, which we'll go over next week, um, that she said that like getting the concept that there is no high yield out of her mind actually helped her. Now, don't get me wrong, there are high yield pass, um, concepts for sure. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm trying to say is, to, is that she basically said if she didn't know something, she studied it, period. If she didn't know something, she studied it. That's it. So those two things really helped her out. But yes, MSLR, and she said that MSLR helped her, especially for the bio section. So absolutely, it will definitely help you. Okay, and then Pyle says, how does one-on-one -on -one sessions work? Um, again, I would shoot me an email, and I'll email you back with what I think about that. I, I'm not really like advertising tutoring or anything. It's kind of like not what I'm trying to focus on, but let's have a conversation, and if you want, to do one-on-one -on -one sessions, um, let's set up like a 30-minute phone call and I can kind of dive into your story and see if, see if it's going to be something that would actually benefit you. 
before we just kind of say, yeah, you know, sign up here. It's this much money and this much money. So um, I'll shoot you an email. Probably, let me write that down. I'll shoot you an email. And we'll just set up a phone call. That way we can do it outside of the study group. So it's not too much of a burden for the other guys. So I'll just write down to set up a phone call with you. Was it that you're actually are you the are you the one I think you're the one that that your brother reached out right? Because I think yeah yeah your brother was on yeah yeah that's very kind of and he's in med school as well right? He's at Baylor. Yep, awesome, awesome. Yeah, he seems like a very nice person. Yeah, I'll absolutely call you. Yeah, no worries, no worries. Um, but any other yeah of course any other questions regarding the actual like method of studying or the approach to cars or. I mean, anything that you guys are stressed out about, anything about motivation, um, that's actually a good way to kind of close this out just while you guys think of more questions. I said it at the beginning of this session that from my experience and my observations and my own personal introspection, the two biggest reasons why students become successful is because, number one, they have a process to study. They have an actual process. And for me, that process looks like this. And number two, they have the motivation to commit. Oh my God, it's unbelievable how much emotional maturity and emotional intelligence is the difference, right? It's so crazy. Being able to commit, being able to have a reason for why you're even doing this is going to make it interesting enough for you to get up and do it. No one's going to have to tell you to study. No one's going to have to, to, to calm you down. You're going to want to study. Guys, I cannot tell you that those 10 weeks, like when I took the MCAT the third time, the 10 weeks that I spent studying were by far some of the greatest 10 weeks of my life because I learned so much about myself. I was able to grow emotionally. I was able to like, I was so like healthy as well. I was like getting up at, at a, you know, I had a routine. I would get up at, you know, like just before seven, I would go to bed um, by uh, 1130-ish. I would go for a walk in the mornings. I would drink a lot of water in the mornings. I wouldn't eat breakfast until, you know, like 11 or 12 because, like, that just works for me. You know, I'd go to walk, walk in the park. I would like, do some, like, pull-ups and push-ups and stuff at the park, and then I would say hi to the neighbors, and I would come back, and I would meditate, and I would shower. And I realized that, like, my whole day, I wasn't so fixated on just the MCAT. Like, my life wasn't just the MCAT. The MCAT was a structure that I built the rest of my life around but all in all, I learned so much about myself and my, my ability to commit to something, my ability to get, to get a reason for why I do what I do and to just work hard and to find the perspectives that would make me enjoy the process of studying, enjoy learning, enjoy growing as an individual, enjoy becoming the person that's good enough for medical school. That's why I really, really, really appreciate the MCAT in a lot of ways. And people look at me like I'm weird when I say that sometimes, but I'm not lying. Um, so, yeah, that's basically two things, the process to study and the motivation to commit. And as you guys are thinking about more questions, I will tell you that when I've talked to students, I've found, and even with my own personal motivation, that, that that's the motivation. The motivation is to be good enough for medical school. Like, it's not necessarily because, like, I want to be a doctor. I want to help people. Saying I want to help people doesn't get me to sit down and study for eight hours a day. I'm sorry. It's not that vivid. It's not that clear. But for me, it's more like I want to be good enough. Like I want to be able to know that I was good enough to get in. And a lot of people tell me about should they take the MCAT, should they not take the MCAT because they heard that med school is hard, being a doctor is hard, this is hard, that's hard. And I sympathize with you guys. I really do. And I had the same uh, sets of rationalizations as well, but let me tell you something very bluntly: that there's no there's no real reason to ask yourself should I or shouldn't I, because you don't even have the choice. If you don't take the MCAT, if you don't crush the MCAT, you won't even have the choice of do I or should I or shouldn't I become a doctor. Right now, that's not your focus. Your focus should be on let me crush the MCAT and then give myself the choice which is what I found after literally two and a half years of struggling with this freaking test, that I was like, okay, I just got to commit because it's not about going to med school. It's not about going to doctor. It's about I need to be free from this exam 
so that I can then have the choice and I can say, you know what, med school, you know what, it's not for me. It's not for me. I'm going to go somewhere else. But at least I know that I would be, that, 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 that that's an option, that I'd be good enough for that. Or if you get a good score and you say, okay, now I have the option, yes, I definitely want to go ahead and pursue medical school because I know I'm a right fit. It fits my, my lifestyle. It fits my, my desires, my values. Let's go, ahead, let's go ahead and approach it. But neither of those two choices, neither of those two options are going to happen unless you do the MCAT. And this is a sad truth, but I remember reading on Reddit, they, the AMC recently did an Ask Me Anything and they're talking about how, like, it's not going to change for a long time. Like, this is pretty much, like, the way it is. And, like, all these different vague, uh, you know, answers. But essentially, guys, like, it's kind of true. Like, the MCAT's been around for a while. And like I said, it's a standardized test that medical colleges use because when you're in business, when you're in an organization, you have to make decisions. You're going to want to make data-based decisions. And you're, no, you're going to want to make data-based decisions and you're going to want to make uh, less subjective decisions. So MCAT is a data-based decision, guys. GPA is a data-based decision. Even though you're the greatest, sweetest person in the world, they're looking at the data first. So that's the way it is. Um, now, I suppose since we have a couple more minutes, so you guys haven't asked me any more questions, I'll continue with that rant. Um, but let's assume that you get a good score on the MCAT, guys. I would say, personally speaking, I would say that the next thing, if you're thinking about the, if you think about the mindset of an academic counselor, like the, like the, the people who are reading through the exams, you have an MCAT score and a GPA that gets you to the top of the pile, and then now you're sitting, you're being read, right? So again, these counselors are human beings, and human beings have very, very similar biases across the spectrum of biases. Um, now, imagine yourself as a, as a person reading the, the applications. Now, you look at this guy, okay, great, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Michael's got a, uh, uh, got a, got a 509 in the MCAT, fantastic. He's got a 3.6 GPA, all right, cool. Let's read about his story. Okay, so you're reading about his story, and you're like, okay, you know, he wanted to help people, he's had this experience, he's had that experience. Great, so he sounds like every other student I've ever read in my life. So this is where, after you get through the MCAT, I think the next and most important, probably the only most important thing is your personal statement, is to make the personal statement memorable. And I'm not going to go into how to do that because it's not the focus. You're still on MCAT. But once you guys get to the MCAT, shoot me an email and I'll tell you exactly how to break down and how to tell a story in a way that people remember it. But that's a very important thing that no one teaches the students how to do but from the business side of things, from, from the organizational side of things, is probably the mo one of the most important things, is being able to tell a story in a way that gets it to stick so that when the, you know, when the you know, uh, admissions counselors are reading through all the applications, the one they remember is like, oh, yeah, who was that guy that, like, that, like uh, did this and this and this? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're going to remember you. So... We all have those stories. We might be worried about, like, okay, do we have those stories? Yes, we all do. It's just about crafting it in a way that sticks. We all have stories. As honest as we can be, it's going to be a great story no matter what. So, yeah, guys, when it comes to having a process to study, um, that's, the, that's actually the easy part. It's the motivation to commit that's the difficult part. So you've got to find that for yourselves. These are the different motivations that I had for me and my, the people that I worked with and my friends, people who, I, who also tested. They were like, yeah, pretty much it's just like, being good enough for med school. Like, that's the goal. I want to at least know that I'm good enough. It's not about being a doctor, helping people. It's about, I want to crush this exam because I know that this exam will be proof, will be proof that I'm good enough. So that's, that's, that's what the job is. Um, okay, that's the end of my rant, and it's pretty much almost noon. So any last questions before I dip out, and I'll see you guys next week, and you guys can always email me. Let me put my email up real quick. My website's up there. There's a bunch of resources that I'm com continuing to pile on there. Again, um, it's, it's there for you guys. Uh, uh, my email address is there as well, nicholas at secondchancemcat.com. And you can always feel free to, to shoot me an email or go to my website and fill out the contact form, send me a message from there, 
or send me a message on Facebook or Reddit or wherever you guys find me, Quora, um, meetup.com. I have a meetup group in Los Angeles, uh, and uh, that's where I'm at right now. And so, yeah, you've got plenty of ways to, to, to contact me, and hopefully this was helpful. I'll try to get this recording out to you guys soon. Let me pause the recording right here real quick.